Welcome to another Human Red audiobook by the United Marxist Fast Discord server, link below in the description. In this series, we continue our investigation into the initial construction, the organizational structure, and the principles and tactics of the form of worker organization capable of seizing political power and establishing the revolutionary proletarian dictatorship and communality which can in turn produce the communist mode of production through the shared class interests of the workers of the entire world. Our goal is to compile, analyze, and elaborate on what all of these texts have to say about this, and at the end have a strong understanding of the exact scientific process of this, particularly in general terms. At the end of our readings as a whole, we will try to put it all together and present it as a coherent whole in an educational video with associated notations. Today's reading will be the 1922 Communist Party of Italy's Second Congress, the Theses of Rome, in other words, and specifically the Theses on Tactics and Theses on the Agrarian Question. We have a pre-written textual analysis on the terms of the aforementioned topics, which is already posted, also posted in the pinned comment if you prefer to read it in text. And follow the link in the description to a read-only version of my Google Docs notes. This will summarize the contents of the text, but is no replacement for the actual reading itself, for the sake of understanding the context. In addition, in the reading I supply my own commentary, critiques, additions, etc., which may be helpful for understanding some particularities. So, for our actual summary, in this text, in terms of worker organization, construction, structure, principles, and tactics, it advises that the party take different tactical approaches to different categories of proletarians found in different industries. For to carry out these tactics, it may involve the construction of multiple organizations, but all such organizations should be under the direction of the shared and major organization, which in turn answers to the party, which does not get drawn to partial interests, but maintains general interests. In terms of agrarian industries, the party must make a ma single major organization to 1. Agitate, propagandize, and organize the rural masses. It must organize and unify all propaganda and agitation efforts in rural areas. 2. Connect all communist groups in rural areas. It must organize and unify all local communist movements in rural areas. 3. Have productive connection between this agrarian section and the trade union committees of the communist party. It must create new organizations and bring current ones under the Communist Party through internal conquest. As to say, through whatever process they have for choosing leadership, communists need to get into those positions. Four, ultimately, this is the part of the task to maximize tactics on a national and international basis. This major organization should be an executive body that implements political and, political and organizational structure drawn up by the party's executive committee. The organ should be constituted in the executive committee, have at least one executive committee member in it, and have its membership selected by the executive committee on the basis of competence in regards to agrarianism. And I will now begin the full audiobook reading. I hope you enjoyed the session and will attend next time as well. Welcome back to another session of United Marxist Pact. We are finally starting a new text. We just finished Gorder's open letter to Comrade Lenin. Now we will be reading the 1922 Communist Party of Italy's Second Congress, Theses of Rome. I I'm not actually going to read the full title because it's got a lot of weird stuff in it. <laughs> so this is in particular on the agrarian um, Theses on the Agrarian Question. So, let's get started. Theses on the Agrarian Question, parts 1 through 8, starting Agrarian Tasks of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat, the Communist Party, and the Peasants in the Phase of the Struggle for the Conquest of Power, How the Agrarian Proletariat is Organized, Organization of semi-proletarians, organization of small farmers, middle landowning farmers, property of the landlords, and the agrarian section of the Communist Party. I want to say, in America, the agrarian question is also going to be complex because we actually have very few, I, I don't know if we actually have any 
thing that we would call small farmers. We, we might have middle landowning farmers, but pretty much any... Well, well, we'll read what it has to say, and I'm not too educated on this matter, but perhaps we will be able to figure out some particular characteristics. Part 1. Agrarian Tasks of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat 1. Communism wants to organize, systematically, on a world scale, the production and distribution of products with the aim of fully utilizing the resources of nature, of progressively reducing the work effort necessary for the existence of mankind, and of forming a class of society in which everyone gives according to his ability and receives according to his needs. From this revolution will be benefit mainly the class masses of the rural workers who, uh, uh, precisely because of the current capitalist order in society, they are currently at a low quality of life. I'm actually going to put this in our thread on the communist mode of production. Um, here. Two. The systematic organization of production requires a maximum div division and specialization, both national and international, of labor, and therefore collective labor. But the necessary material and technical conditions for collective work do not exist in all branches of production. It cannot exist simultaneously in all branches, as long as capitalism is in force, which, because of it, its organic way of functioning under pressure of individual interests and competition, must necessarily lead to the prevalence of some groups of interests to the detriment of others. Therefore, the indispensable condition for the creation in all branches of production of the material technical conditions which will make it possible their socialization and organization on a national and international scale is the political and economic overthrow of capitalism and the transfer of power to the proletariat through the proletarian revolution. Okay, um, I'm also going to add this first bit. Um, actually, I'll add the entire part, but the first bit is the only thing that is specifically about science mode production. Um, the rest is about the need to get rid of capitalism. Now, you know, this is useful information because one of the topics in there is the efficiency of capital, the, the inefficiency of capitalism and the efficiency of communism. Um, of which there is much to say. Three, there is thus a period of transition between capitalism and communism in which the present ruling class of capitalists disappears through the socialization of big industry, banking, transport, etc. And in its place, the direction of society passes to the proletariat of the socialized enterprises. In this period, there are still more or less considerable remains of private production alongside economic forms dating back to even more ancient phases. And therefore, there are other classes with an economic social figure more or less distinct from that of the proletariat. This period of transition is that of the dictatorship of the proletariat. In its dictatorship, the proletariat, having become the ruling class, uses political power in accordance with its class aims in order to favor the advent, in all fields of production, of the real conditions necessary to pass gradually to the socialization and organization of all production. During this long and laborious process, various forms of transition are determined, in which the archaic economic types undergo continuous modifications until they merge into the general type of the great productive enterprise, organized according to the most perfected technical methods, managed by the entire community and in the service of universal human needs. But it's precisely this progressive modification of the archaic economic stratification that implies their substantial permanence for a more or less long time. And we're going to put this in our thread on the dictatorship of the proletariat. Part 5. In capitalism, agriculture cannot follow at the same pace as the development of industry. Uh, this is because agriculture, in particular, rests upon time, right? 
um, you can't really speed up the chemical processes because it's very much um, held in in accordance to the seasons. And, you know, you can have greenhouses and maybe we might see a development of serious um, technological solutions to crops such as um, vertical farming and stuff like that which are entirely indoors but I wouldn't hold my breath on that for any large-scale production of foodstuffs so until things change significantly um, you, there is a maximum amount of organic composition of capital that can really be a part of farming anyway Therefore, among the backwards economic forms, which cannot be socialized at the moment of the establishment of the proletarian dictatorship due to the lack of necessary technical preconditions, as is the case in Italy, right beside a small industry, the artisan and the merchant companies, we see the great majority of agricultural companies to the forefront. 6. Therefore, the Communist Party, which has become the government party with the success of the proletarian dictatorship, can and must proceed towards the immediate expropriation and state management either directly or through cooperative organizations of the large agrarian farms of the capitalist type which are already conducted on the basis of joint work specialized and equipped with advanced technical equipment but must absolutely avoid the absurd and anti-marxist attempt to socialize the small farms mostly family run in which the means of production land tools inventory etc are not separated from work um, and I question how many of those actually still exist in America. I'm not sure. Actually, hold on. How many family farms are there in the U.S.? 2.1 million. Okay. It doesn't sound right. I, I know that a really substantial portion of, well, maybe they're renting the land i know that they're renting all their machines there and whatnot and it's a big issue for them because they can't actually repair most of their machines deer for example is infamous for this so i, I also wonder how many people are actually if these guys are actually really family farms or if they're um, hiring a bunch of people and the land is just owned by the family. Anyway, seven, the immediate step through the dictatorship, which the dictatorship of the proletariat can and must take towards the introduction of socialism in the countryside as well, is the suppression of land rent not accompanied by work. Therefore, the power of the proletariat immediately abolishes all rights and privileges of present non-working landowners, whether they be private or public persons, banks or institutions of any kind, transforms it without any form of compensation, the possession and free use of the corresponding land to those who cultivate today or who will be able to cultivate personally in the future, exempting them from all obligations towards the former owners for rents, censuses, debts, etc., the place of these obligations and of the right to the land. In place of these obligations and the old land tax, the peasants will thus come into possession of the land, will be obliged to hand over a certain percentage of their produce to the proletarian government in order to defend themselves against the inevitable counter-revolutionary attempts of the dispossessed former landowners and to meet the other needs of the proletarian state. I I'd be careful with this. Um... Uh, be careful with this uh, sides like this are problematic so saying that they're basically saying hey you have to give 10% of your produce to the proletarian government you know, I understand why they're saying that, but that just smacks of um, peasant understanding, right? I don't know. Anyway, eight. 
The lands thus expropriated, as well as industrial plants and facilities, means of transport and communication, bank capital, and any other means of production, are the common property of all the working people of Italy. The proletarian power hands them over to local peasant councils, which assign them to various families of peasants, following the general rules established by the proletarian power and aimed primarily at ensuring the continuity and increase of production and possibly leaving the land in the possession of the current farmers. 9. If the local farmers' councils consider it opportune, and if their proposal is approved by the upper technical and economic councils, which will not always submit their acceptance to a consideration of what will ensure the best and greatest productivity, even the large estates which are territorially united and worked by wage earners, i.e. in the economy, can be subjected to this individual assignment, where, however, the exploitation of the land is currently carried out with the backwards cultivation techniques. In the face of that parceling out of the land in small individual bourgeois companies would represent technical progress and would ensure an increase in productivity. It would be also admissible to detach from the socialized farm these parts that would be necessary to complete the remaining land allocation made to the peasants in an equal way, as long as this detachment does not damage the productive capacity of the farms themselves. The so large socialized farms, after having provided for their own needs, and insofar as is technically possible, must put their machineries, tools, stocks, livestock, technical perso personnel, etc. at the disposal of the local farmers. Existing collective farms and other collectivized farms will keep being subjected to technical needs. I'll put this in. Part 2. The Communist Party and the Peasants in the Phase of the Struggle for the Conquest of Power. I, again, America doesn't really have peasants, so... Yeah. Anyway, 10. The transfer of useful land ownership to the peasants in the ways indicated above is to be considered as the completion of the bourgeois revolution against the conspicuous remnants of the pre-bourgeois and semi-feudal order still in force in agrarian relations in large parts of Italy, especially in southern Italy and in the islands. At the same time as it completes the bourgeois revolution, it will also be the first to start the rev socialist revolution in the countryside as well. The revolution of the peasants, through the abolition of land rent separated from work, is presented throughout the world, and particularly in Italy, as an inescapable necessity, especially after the disaster caused by the war. That would be World War I, of course. As the only means to curb and mitigate the risk, rise, and costs of living. In fact, while the current regime is, example, the predominance of monopoly financial capitalism, most of the wealth derived from land ends up as a land rent in the pockets of a few tens of thousands of absent landowners, landlords and idlers, and from them is either dissipated in wasteful spending or deposited in banks and then absorbed by large monopolistic industrial enterprises and armaments in the imperial state of capitalism. Well, on the other hand, the land passes into the free possession of those who personally cultivate it. The part of the produce now confiscated from the worker in the form of seigneurial rent would say in the possession of the worker himself. He'd use it to improve his living conditions and naturally also to increase the productivity of the soil. I, I don't think that that would naturally be the case, but okay. The fruits of which he would now have not have to share with anyone except for the part owned to the state. The fact that in Italy, the subjective conditions for, well, if you're doing a percentile taxation of people for this, then they have no need to do more than subsistence farming. So you need to figure something else out here. Subsistence farming plus 10%. I don't know why this would naturally lead them to increase the productivity of the soil. Okay, anyway. Unless they're presupposing that the peasants are still engaging in market relations and, and exchanging, which I, I suppose that makes sense. Um, but we're supposed to be dissolving that ideally faster.
and also nationalizing all the land. Okay, anyway. The fact that in Italy, the subjective conditions for the peasant revolution exist in more or less conscious state is proved by how they show their impatience with their own conditions, and which is manifested in the massive wave of emigration that is moving away that followed the armistice and favored by the bourgeois government as a safety valve against the discontent of the peasants, despite the obvious need for work towards, quote, economic reconstruction. The intensity of this discontent on the part of the great mass of poor peasants was demonstrated by the great land occupation movement that took place in the second half of 1920. 11. The aspiration of the Italian peasant to freely possess the land can never be satisfied. As, uh, this isn't important for us. We're, we're just going to, um, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to skip down. Um, part three, how the agrarian proletariat is organized. That, that's up above was historically important. It's not so much for anything that we're doing. 14, wage earners working in the field of Italy can be divided into three main categories. A, laborers and workers who work for wages in the large agricultural or land development enterprises of a capitalist type. Conditions very similar to those of proletarians in industry. B. Salaried workers hired for the entire agricultural year for all the work needed on the land or for a limited time and for special work by non-working owner or his representative in estates run on the economic basis according to rational systems of individual cultivation. C. Salaried auxiliary workers who throughout the agricultural year for a limited time work on land belonging to working owners or on land cultivated by sharecroppers. The Communist Party, in organizing this class, must take into account the different conditions of the various categories, formulating their respective programs of action, and if necessary, creating separate organizations, but under the direction of a single major local organization, which will lead the common fight against the rural bourgeoisie. So, we're going to take this. This, this is a good quote right there. Okay. And we're going to take a quick note on it. Okay, so the Communist Party needs to take different approaches for different categories of proletarians in various industries. This may involve multiple organizations, but all such organizations should be under the direction of a single major one. Back to the text. 15. Category A which would be the laborers and workers who work for wages, um, similar to proletarians in industry, almost forms a whole uh, the industrial proletariat for which, with which it shares the final communist aims and immediate aims of improving working conditions, the methods of struggle and the type of organization. The proletarian dictatorship will remove it from the servitude of agrarian capitalism and transform it into a category of workers of the proletarian state, which with the industrial workers will constitute the ruling class and assume the political and economic management of the state. The proletarian state will give these workers conditions for work, remuneration, welfare, and social production, so that their situation will be superior to that of the small independent peasant, who will thus be more easily induced to become part of this category. Nevertheless, this category will have to be kept on in the forefront of the distribution of expropriated lands. So um, I'm going to go into dictatorship of the proletariat, and we're going to have some repetition probably. Um, let's see. No, never mind. No, never mind. I need to do some spacing. <laughs> there we go. Okay. 16. The proletarian dictatorship, in order to increase and improve agrarian production, will try to transform even the large estates, which are run in primitive and backward way, into model state farms, managed with cutting-edge techniques, and to which the fact of administrative unity does not confirm greater productive potential. It therefore uses all possible ways of persuasion and excitement to induce employees currently employed in these estates to accept the transformation into state farms or at least associate with each other to manage them in a cooperative. 
In the latter case, the proletarian state will help the cooperative organization of production with all available means, capital, improved tools and machines, seeds, fertilizers, drainage and roadworks, special technicians, etc. When, however, the wage earners, despite everything, prefer to parcel out the estate, including excluding always of course those conducted with perfect techniques the proletarian dictatorship while warning that in this way the peasants as a great mass will not achieve a real improvement in their conditions will not oppose the sharing of land to the former master and of all related equipment livestock working capital etc however in the interest of production it will reserve the right to monitor and decide which ways the allocation of allocated land will be used, revoking, if necessary, the allocation against those whose treatment of the land represents a step back compared to their previous conditions. On the other hand, even for those small peasants who will prefer individual to individually cultivate the land assigned to them, the proletarian state will make every possible facility to increase their productivity. In the peasant, present period of struggle for the conquest of power, the claims of category B um, which were the salaried workers that are um, full-time or, or are for limited or special work um, hired by non-working owner. Coincide substantially with those of the preceding category so that they can, if necessary, constitute a single organization. Category C cannot be compromised the assignment of the land. Um, again, those are the salaried auxiliary workers who just come in every so often which remains with the present owner workers it will however be at the forefront of the assignment of the lands expropriated from the landlords thus largely assimilating itself in terms of its file program the conditions which the dictatorship of the proletariat will create for it into category b Furthermore, the proletarian government will make sure to facilitate in every way the stipulation of free agreements between these proletarians and their respective employers so that the work performed by the wage earners will be transformed into a share in the management and profits of the company. Today, demands this type cannot be directed against the employer, but against the capitalist and agrarian bourgeoisie, which exploits both worker-owner and the proletarians in category C. Therefore, any conflict between the small owner workers or sharecroppers and their employees must be resolved by peaceful negotiations between the respective organizations using mediation. In the case of irreconcilability, compulsory arbitration by local central organization. The central organization will also see to that every agitation of small farmers for improvements in farm or sharecropping agreements, etc., accompanied by the recognition on the part of tenants, sharecroppers, etc., of corresponding improvements to the wage earners, and reciprocally, that all union agitation of the latter is integrated and merged with the agitation of the small farmers for the improvements of farm and sharecropping agreements, etc., and that the latter's agitation is accompanied by the recognition of corresponding improvements to the wage or earners. Part 4. Organization of Semi-Proletarians 18. This category includes the peasants who cultivate a few pieces of land rented or owned by them, but the profits are not enough to cover their workforce and to ensure their livelihood, so they are forced to supplement their income by working even for wages. 19. Except in exceptional cases, of which the local central trade union organization is the judge, it is not advisable to form separate organizations for this category. Those who belong to it will join the organization of wage earners or that of small holders, depending on whether the interests of one or the other prevails in each individual case. 5. Organization of Small Farmers 20. This category consists of those peasants who live off the produce of the land that they themselves, alongside their families, cultivated without having to supplement their income by working elsewhere for wages and without regularly employing wage labor themselves. So, uh, this isn't important for us. No peasants after all. Middle of part six, middle owning land, middle land owning farmers. This category is made up of landowners who cultivate the land directly with their own personal labor and that of their families, but who also normally employ additional paid labor. 
these middle class landowners interested as they are in maintaining the possibility of exploiting the rural proletarians and semi proletarians and speculating on the rise of agricultural products and threatened by the expropriation of that part of the land which exceeds the possibility of their personal labor, cannot be ideologically conquered by the proletarian revolution. This is what I suspect is the vast majority of what we would were considered in America small family landowner or uh, farmers. Therefore, the revolutionary trade union movement has no interest in organizing them. On the contrary, it must hinder and fight the organizations which they may have formed and fully support them against them, the struggles of the wage earners which they employ. And after the conquest of power, it will normally exclude them from the peasants' councils. However, it is impo it's not impossible to obtain the neutrality of this concept, or category, excuse me, or at least of a part of it. Those who belong to it generally are not capitalists, and therefore have no interest in the preservation of the capitalist regime as such. And in opposing the socialization of big industry, the dictatorship of the proletariat as a transitional phase will preserve for them the possession of all that part of the land which they can cultivate themselves, in certain cases even a part of which exceeds its possibility. When this is required by the interests of production, or when there is a free agreement between them and the wage earners, example, on the basis of the transformation of wages into a share of the product. On the other hand, the proletarian dictatorship will bring the same advantages to the medium-sized landowners as to the small ones. Abolition of land tax, private debts, consensuses, mortgages, infertutic rents. What is this word? must improve the property with construction i see etc so abolition of value added taxes okay a general policy of the proletarian state directed towards favoring agricultural production in a special way and towards helping the farmers to introduce more profitable agricultural systems etc Therefore, a policy of pro compromises and agreements between the revolutionary rural organizations and the af these average owner farmers is possible and even necessary. I'm going to take this entire bit and add it to the dictatorship of the proletariat. I have no, I don't know the particulars of America's conditions, so. Part 7, the property of the landlords, 25. To those among the landlords who do nothing but appropriate a part of the products of the land cultivated by other settlers, tenant farmers, sharecroppers, etc., the proletarian dictatorship has nothing to offer. It is a question of gentlemen who do not personally work on in the countryside in the slightest and yet parasitically earn income from it, as well as of capital speculators who rent vast expanses of land and then sublet them to the peasants. They will certainly be expropriated in full and without any form of compensation. If they participate personally in the cultivation of land, only that portion of land which they can exploit in their own direct labor and that of their families will be exempted from expropriation, except the expropriation will be completed at the first hint and have resistance and rebellion. Therefore, this class will be in the countryside, the fiercest opponent of the Communist Party, and in the future of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Against it, the struggle of the revolutionary organizations of peasants will be mainly directed. Their first objective will be the disarmament of the lords and their dogs, mobsters, dealers, fascists, white lords, in short, every kind of them. This is guaranteed by the fact that they own arms. Part 8. The Agrarian Section of the Communist Party in order to engage in the work of propaganda, agitation, and organization among the rural masses, as well as in for the formation, connection, and activity of the kinds groups and the existing local and central organizations of workers of the land, the Congress resolves that an agrarian section be constituted in the EC of the party. Uh, what's the EC of the party again? Uh, EC of Communist Party. Executive Community. Gotcha. Composed of one or more members of the uh, executive uh, uh, committee and other comrades chosen by the executive committee from among those who have the greatest competence in agrarian and organizational questions. 
The work of the agrarian section will be carried out in continuous contact and collaboration with the trade union committee of the Communist Party. 28. The agrarian section is only an executive body that does nothing but implement, in a practical and local way, the political and organizational directives drawn up by the executive committee of the party on the basis of the decisions of the national and international congresses. It can also be set up in a different location from that of the executive committee, preferably in southern Italy. 29. Its main functions will be a to organize, unify, and discipline the agitation and propaganda work among the peasants through the creation of agrarian committees for each agricultural region, elected by local organizations of the party and directly corresponding with the section. The sending of propagandists and the distribution of pamphlets and newspapers is proposed that two weekly and fortnightly newspapers be founded, one for the agricultural proletarians and the other for the small farmers. B. To direct and unify the work of communist groups in the already existing rural organizations, turning it towards the conquest of these organizations. C. To promote the creation of new organizations, making them systematically join the existing class organizations, Federation of the Land Workers and Federation of the Cooperatives. While they are still led by reformist and counter-revolutionary elements with the aim of preventing a split of the, in the rural working class and, and increasing the influence of revolutionary elements in the existing organizations, thus facilitating their conquest. D. To maintain the closest local and national connection between the organizations that follow the tactics of the Communist Party. And E. To give, subjected to the authority of the Executive Committee of the Party, the provisions concerning struggles of local and regional character, and possibly also for those involved in the agricultural working mass of the whole country. Okay. Um, let's see. So create an agricultural section and then that agriculture. Okay, just take all of these. And then we're going to take all this. Okay, so the Communist Party should create that single major organization in order to a. Agitate, propagandize, and organize the rural masses. B. Connect all communist groups in rural areas. C. Have productive connections between this agrarian section and the trade union committee of the Communist Party. 2. It should have be an executive body that implements political and organizational directives drawn up by the executive committee. And this is done by having it be constituted in the executive committee, has having at least one executive committee member in it and having its membership selected by executive committee on the basis of competence in regards to agrarian and organizational questions. All right, so this committee will one organize and unify all propaganda and agitation efforts in rural areas, two organize and unify all communist movements in rural locations, three Create new organizations and bring current ones under a par communist party through internal conquests and four maximize tactics on a national and international basis. And that's that text. We had much more useful stuff in terms of the dictatorship of the proletariat and also some nice quotes for the communist mode of production. But um that's the end of the thesis on tactics and theses on the agrarian question from the um, 1922 Communist Party, at least Second Congress theses of Rome.